you're here tonight to meet and listen to um, David Michalis. David is, as you know, is a writer and a biography, and he is the author of two best-selling um, biographies, one by N.C. Wyeth, which won the American the Ambassador Book Award. And he was also uh, another biography of Charles Schultz and Peanuts, which was a National Book Critics Circle Best Recommended Book. So um, as you can see, he is a very prolific and very uh, well thought of writer. He is also a contributor to articles, periodicals, mainly uh, American Heritage, Esquire, Reader's Digest, New York, and others. And he is, of course, the author of this book, Eleanor, which is a which is the first one volume bio of Eleanor Roosevelt in six decades, which is an amazing thing as for those people who were listening before that we were talking about. Um, there have been two um, historians, Michael Besh Beshlov and Walter Isaacson, who have endorsed the book and called it a perfect biography for our times. So it is my pleasure to introduce David McCallis. Well, I hope I keep saying it now. I didn't. Did, just perfect, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming tonight and joining the fireside chat here. Um, I'm so sorry we're on Zoom. I'm so sorry. I'm your neighbor. I'm over here in Bedford. So I'm really sorry not to be just simply standing, you know, in front of you and um, and being able to talk because um, as Joan and I were saying, this book is very unlikely. Um, when she says it's the first one volume biography in six decades, what we're talking about really is that, well, in, in a practical sense, um, there have been multiple, there have been biographies of Eleanor and Franklin, as you know, there, there are multiple, there's a great multi, multiple, multi-volume biography of Eleanor um, by Blanche Wiesen Cook, um, which was very much the sort of standard biography of Eleanor that I, when I began work in 2009, although Blanche hadn't finished her, her great monument um, by the time I went, when I began, there was another volume to come and, and that did come. Um, but what we're talking about here is a life that is so long and in one sense, um, in that it covers uh, you know, it begins in the Victorian age and ends in the atomic age. It, it's about a woman who goes from being a, an orphan um, in, in, an, in a sheltered um, and, and upper class and, and aristocratic New York world to be the global champion of human rights. And there's no way to see the transformations of Eleanor, to see the vast stretch of the 20th century that she covers I think without seeing it really in one go, sort of like doing the whole thing in charades. Um, but it's so difficult to compress and bring all those ages, all the different aspects of her life and the different aspects of her transformation um, into one single story that is going to bring you into a book of less than four or 500 pages. Um, it's just a challenge. And so what you see before you is really a a kind of, to me anyhow, um, is to this day a kind of miracle because Eleanor's um, life as first lady began in um, 19, March of 1933, of course, and the depression had sunk its teeth deep into the country and the devaluation of the individual was the painful daily lesson um, of, the, um, of the depression. And, and the greatest industrial nation was at a standstill. And Eleanor, when she and Franklin Roosevelt, her husband, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt came into the White House, she felt obliged, um, she said to a friend, to notice everything. Uh, she said, um, you know, I, I, I wanna notice everything and everyone. And she was this, she had always noticed things in a way that people spoke about Eleanor when they, um, in, in, in later years about how she looked at them, how she would stare, literally stare at you sometimes. Um, she would look at people and it, the individual had always been the focus of her attention. Uh, it was one thing I noticed right away about the story was that she moved from the individual to, she once said, the, one of the curious things about me is that I've always seen life personally out of my response to an individual develops a awareness of a problem 
um, in a community and then uh, the problem in the state and then in the country and then finally um, in the world itself. And it's how she moved. She moved from the universal, from the particular to the universal. It was always the synecdical movement and, and her own life moved this way. Um, and it's really one of the most um, astonishing things when you get into this life, when you start realizing where she began and then where she ended. Um, and it never quite fits, except she always does. She always remains herself. But how she got from, uh, from being the Eleanor of, of the childhood, childhood from hell to the Eleanor of global human rights is, is something that I think we could just run through here quickly. And I won't keep you um, for, for, for homework after, but I just wanted to kind of look at her life very quickly and, and suggest what this transformation is about. And when I say childhood from hell, I'm talking about, you know, a Dickensian childhood where her mother, um, who was a great uh, society belle, uh, second most uh, beautiful woman of New York, um, so-called. Uh, the first was an Astor, uh, of course. Um, but she was of an old family, um, uh, that is to say, Rebecca, Anna Rebecca Hall, who married Theodore Roosevelt's brother, Elliot Roosevelt. Anna Rebecca Hall came from an old New York family, at, like the Roosevelt's. Uh, the Halls were actually, um, had made a fortune in wool. Uh, but by this time, with that is to say, the Morgans, the Vanderbilts, the great industrial nation um, building its enormous mansions on Fifth Avenue and the, the wealth of the United States pouring into New York City, um, a, 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 a town of, of immense poverty, um, uh, uh, along with this vast wealth, our great mixed city, Eleanor always called it, and it was really her first experience of a multi-ethnic pluralist democracy. Um, but as a child, she was a uh, uh, really quite pretty in a way and beautiful um, in another way. And in another way, she was not seen as either by, um, by her mother. Her father loved her. Her father was the one person she felt in her life who did love her, who understood her, and she had a real connection to him. Um, she saw him as a, a there's sort of like a, like a Dickens couple, those two. They, she's a little old woman seeing a, a very young boy. And she's treating him that way and he loves it. He loved that she would wake up in the morning and shake her finger at him and say, you've got to get out of bed. He, he'd have a terrible hangover. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He was a self-medicator. He broke his leg at a society circus uh, when Eleanor was about seven. And when she saw the pain he was in after his leg uh, had festered, it was badly set. I uh, had to be reset. He had to be taken away. By then he was addicted to um, to laudanum. His entire life, Elliot Roosevelt's life, um, broke down um, in pieces um, as Eleanor was in her childhood and moving into her, I mean, by the time Eleanor was 10, she was orphaned by a mother who had died of diphtheria, a brother who died of diphtheria, and her father who had drunk himself to death. She was alone uh, with a, brother, a younger brother, Hall, and they were sent off to her grandmother's house uh, along the Hudson and on 37th Street on the east side. Uh, she lived a strange life with the Hall, with her Hall family because she was sort of the grown-up. Again, she was sort of the older, the, the, the grown-up. She was in charge of things. The uh, Halls were unable to do things for themselves. They were a rich family fallen down now into um, this period very similar to the Magnificent Ambersons, which is why I included the photograph in the lower left there. Um, it, it is the moment at which um, the industrial fortunes are taking over and these people are marginalized. They're feeling as if once upon a time they had everything they needed and wanted and, and life was good and now it's getting pretty thin. And her uncles were alcoholics. They had begun their lives as men about town and great tennis champions, the first champions of the game of lawn tennis. Uh, Uncle Valley, Uncle Eddie were constantly in jail. They were constantly being challenged in court. Uh, they were assaulting women. They were uh, drinking at the tenderloin. Eleanor was the one who was sent to bail them out. She could talk to an Irish desk sergeant as her grandmother, Ms. Uh, 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 Grandmother Hall could not as her aunt Pussy and her aunts uh, a tizzy and uh, uh, you know, we're, we're absolutely incapable of dealing with the real world. Eleanor began to get her education in the real world by being the kind of uh, family caretaker, the, the trustee almost like a family trustee who looked after these people well into her own adult life. This house uh, on the Hudson 
uh, was still being inhabited by her uncle Valley who would you know shoot um, uh, a shotgun out the window at, at neighboring children uh, and create um, scenes with the local police all the way into Eleanor's life as first lady of the United States. Uh, she never stopped caring for them, taking care of them and being their um, almost in the end, their family undertaker really. She buried them all. Uh, Eleanor's great, the great gift or freedom of her early life was that she got a chance to leave all of this behind and go to England to study under this glamorous, charismatic figure named Marie Souvest, who ran a boarding school right outside London. This is um, in, uh, outside Wimbledon, the Allenswood School, where she was following in the footsteps of her aunt, um, Eleanor, uh, aunt, sorry, her aunt Anna Bami, Bami Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's older, uh, oldest sister, um, very much admired by Madame Souvest, a, who'd been a leader at the school. And now Eleanor very much followed in her footsteps and became the school leader in her time. She was a, uh, she showed herself right at this moment. And she was about 15 when she got there and she immediately began doing the things that you see her do all through her life. She became an intermediary. She was the one who could go between the girls. Other girls at the school were from rich privileged backgrounds uh, from other family, from families around Europe. They were, they were uh, uh, bringing uh, their problems to, to Eleanor to bring to Madame Souvest. She was being, able, she was the go-between. She was the go-between between Madame Souvest and Madame Souvest's lover, actually, who was the uh, school administrator. She was uh, spending her holidays with Madame Souvest, learning um, how to be independent and how to think for herself. Madame Souvet's great lesson was think for yourself. This was a time where women's education was seen to be almost threatening um, to, to women's mental health. It was, it, if, if women learn things, things were gonna get dangerous. Eleanor actually was one of Madame Souvet's um, leaders, one of her great um, pets, but Madame Souvet challenged her and challenged all of them um, on issues of the Boer War then being fought, on, on where they stood, uh, on where they um, stood on, on almost everything um, about their own lives. She would, con she would challenge them uh, existentially. You know, why do you think you're alive? Why do you, why do you think, do you think life has a purpose? Very sophisticated, very, very, um, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, she, Eleanor left the school wanting to be a teacher. She left the school wanting to stay, wanting to be Madame Souvest, and all her life in a way, she wanted to find ways of getting back to this kind of situation where she was going to be a powerful woman among women who, and, and, and bringing new ideas and, and her own ideas to the fore. Um, there was a kind of hitch in her life at this moment. She would have stayed, I think, had she not been forced by her grandmother to come back um, to that house on the Hudson and to live in the city with her Aunt Pussy and to go through the rituals of coming out as a debutante, which was abhorrent to her having this, just had this very sophisticated life um, and, 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 and uh, education to, and suddenly it wasn't thinking of yourself at all. It was going into rooms and Eleanor's experience of this was, was uh, humiliating, it was appalling. She was just discovering herself and, and Aunt Pussy made sure she discovered it one summer in Maine um, when Aunt Pussy got jealous because Eleanor was wearing a beautiful dress that she had come home from Paris with. And uh, Eleanor was very innocent at that point in her life about her father and about her father's history. Her aunt let her have it. She told her, you know, your father uh, had a, you have a brother. Uh, your father fathered a child on the housemaid, um, uh, Katie Mann. And Katie Mann brought a pistol to the lawyer's office and threatened us all. And, and uh, you have, uh, your father was not just a, a, a drunk. He was a, he was a drug addict. And she showed her the headlines and described um, the scandals that that had uh, that Elliot had dragged the family through, and Eleanor's response was to go back and become even better, even more good. Uh, her response was to was to sort of ch challenge herself constantly to to be as good as she could be. And when she got to these rooms, these big ballrooms, in in her debutante days, behind the hands of the matrons and the men who would come to watch the young women be. Uh, brought into society were people gossiping about her uh, about her parents about how awful it was that her father had done this and how sad it was that her mother had not fulfilled her her duties and her I mean her her ambitions as a as a social uh, hostess I mean her mother Eleanor's mother was sort of a um, 
kind of a great figure in society who, who might have been something had, had she you know, really been something, had, had she lived. So Eleanor was this tragic figure. Everyone made it, even, even, even uh, Franklin, her cousin, uh, felt sorry for her when he met her at a dance, but he also knew there was something special about her. And he looked, in her, uh, looked at her from, from a point of view um, that is very clear, that is to say, as the niece of the President of the United States. Eleanor had a glamour and a beauty as a uh, young woman with her hair and her eyes and, and her dazzling smile, but she, it was as a, as a Roosevelt that he saw her. He saw her very much as the niece of his own idol. Uh, young men idolized Theodore Roosevelt. He was the president of the United States. He was something new in the world. He was a president who had fused North with South, East with West. Uh, he was the cowboy president. He was the uh, you know, big leader of the, of the white fleet and, and, and turning America into a global power. Franklin saw himself becoming a Theodore Roosevelt. And so Eleanor was his ticket. And his mother objected. She liked Eleanor. She felt sorry for her. She knew Eleanor's father very well. And in fact, Eleanor's father had been made Franklin's godfather, et cetera, et cetera. So many connections and, and ways that these two were connected. They were a sort of mini power couple right away. Um, and they were married on March uh, the 17th, uh, St. Patrick's Day, when President Theodore Roosevelt came to New York City and gave the bride away. And they were um moving in every direction that you could think of toward a kind of future that would put Franklin in the White House and and it was all to be you know it was, it was all foreordained except for they suddenly discovered on their honeymoon uh that they weren't really very good at intimacy um they they neither of them knew how to please the other uh, Franklin was playful Franklin was was uh, a great deceiver. Franklin was a great charmer. Eleanor was shy. She was pain. It was the social life was painful. Um, when they were visiting friends of Franklin's mother, he she felt completely out of her depth. And in Venice, he got hives. And and they were suddenly discovering that that they were um, they didn't know how to love intimately. Um, and they learned how to love. Both of them learned how to love universally, which is possible, I think, um, for someone, for people like this who don't love intimately to become universally, and you'll see how, but um, it's really hell on the children. And that's, I think, where life got very difficult for Eleanor early on. And that's, that is to say, as a mother. Motherhood was a, was a three-part nightmare for her. On the one hand, she had a mother-in-law who was defining how she would raise her children. Um, and even at, at, birth, at the moment of birth, there was no one whose hand she was holding on to. Her own mother wasn't there. Sarah wasn't there with her. Franklin wasn't there. Who was there was Blanche um, Spring, this lovely woman on the left who became Eleanor's first sort of uh, surrogate mother. There's a sort of line of surrogate mothers through Eleanor's story who took over and helped her become the woman that she became. Um, Blanche uh, Spring uh, from Maine, uh, for her own family was sort of another one of these families that had been rich and now was fallen down. And she got her degree as a nurse and she, she taught Eleanor how to bathe a child, how to feed a child, what to do in the middle of the night. But what was a struggle was that when Eleanor, for instance, and any of you who had children and remember being you know, called by the cry of a child to a crib, you would begin to learn what to do. Well, Eleanor would get to the crib and there'd already be a governess there. And she already would have fed castor oil at, at Sarah's, Mrs. James's, as they called her, Mrs. James's orders would have been to feed castor oil to the child uh, because the child was crying. Eleanor wouldn't even be able to pick her child up in the middle of the night. She was so blocked out by the governesses and the whole structure of uh, her mother-in-law's involvement in their, the young life of Franklin and Eleanor. Franklin himself was a distant husband, um, charming, witty, um, fun, full of fun, but uh, on his way as the assistant secretary of the Navy and down to Washington, they moved. And Eleanor's first you know, exposure to politics and to government and to Washington outside of being Theodore Roosevelt's niece was in this way of being a political wife that she was very good at. And at the same time, she was extremely reserved extremely um, uh, uninterested in suffrage for its own sake. She was, politics was a male, the male domain was the male world. She felt strongly that Franklin, um, you know, was going to have a, had, had the last word in this. She was raising children and 
all of the things that we think of Eleanor, uh, about Eleanor and women, Eleanor and women's rights, um, all, all happen partly because of Franklin's affair with Lucy Mercer, meaning Franklin and Eleanor had a uh, household that was dominated by Franklin's ambitions um, and Eleanor's ability to keep up with both having children, raising children, and then keeping up as, as Franklin's political wife meant that she hired this Lucy Mercer, who was a um, social woman from Washington. She had a, her own family was very similar to Ellen, Eleanor's. Her, her father was an alcoholic. Her mother was a, 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 um, uh, a great society lady. Um, and Lucy Mercer immediately joined the household as a warm, um, kind, affectionate presence whom Franklin um, uh, first was attracted to and simply as someone he could tease and josh and, and be kidded by. And then gradually um, as, as Summers uh, in Campobello when, with Eleanor away with the children, uh, they fell in love. Franklin and, and Lucy fell in love. Eleanor found their letters um, in the summer of uh, 1918 after Franklin returned from Europe from a trip with the, uh, with, with the Navy to, to the front. Uh, and World War I, um, as it was going on, had dominated Franklin's life and had given him cover for this affair with Lucy Mercer. With the affair came, with the, Eleanor's discovery of the affair, came her awareness that she had nothing now with Franklin. She felt their life would, as, as intimates was over, but she was unwilling, she, and she offered divorce. Franklin was, was not going to be um, stretching a career you know, he could not have gotten divorced and kept his standing is how he looked at it. His mother refused also. She was very much on Eleanor's side, wanted uh, the marriage to continue. Um, Lucy Mercer was not the iron frame on which to stretch a, a, a political life. Um, it took Eleanor also to stand up to Mama. Uh, that, that She was beginning to learn how to do that. Um, and if FDR was going to be who he was going to be, um, I think they both knew that that it was going to be as a political figure and and his personal life was not as important to him um, as 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 it might have been in if he had not had this ambition. And I think he had a clear picture in a way of what his life would be if if he were going to become a divorced man. So that was not going to happen. And with the beginnings of um, Eleanor's independence, that is to say, not going back to a marriage now, but going on into the war um, as the political wife who was called on first with other women to join women's organizations exploded during the war. Women began to learn how to do things and they learned how to do things in the public sphere for the first time and were given the chance to because of the war. Um, Eleanor and her some of her uh, co-equals in Washington discovered how little they knew how to do. Uh, it, Eleanor was sort of appalled by this and pushed herself even harder to, at, a, at a canteen in, in, in Union Station to really learn a lot about it, running something. And she learned how to run that canteen. Uh, she also learned a lot about the men who were going through there. The entire, practically the entire Eastern seaboards um, recruits, millions of young men were flowing through this one choke point, um, coffee and letters and, and all that were given out in Union Station from the canteen. But she was also talking to them and learning how little they knew about where they were going. And the same happened when they came home. She was there when they came home uh, from the war uh, in 1918 and 1919. She saw young men um, in caskets where no family was present for the burial. And she stood there herself to be sure someone was witnessing uh, the, the burial of a white serviceman, but particularly with African-American servicemen. She went to St. Elizabeth's because it was where the Navy was sending their shock, their shell-shocked uh, troops, uh, shell-shocked sailors, sorry. Um, there was no um, word for this at the time. shell shock was suddenly this new um, uh, way of describing um, this crisis that these men were in. Uh, they'd lost their minds. They didn't know how to behave, how to act, how to think. They were barely human and they were sort of burritoed in line in rooms. And Eleanor had to force herself to go into these rooms. She had um, horrible memories and phobias from a real phobia of being in a room where crazy people were from her own father's inc incarcerations during uh, several sanatoria 
that he went to in, in Europe where she was sort of brought in as a child to see him and visit him. And so she was terrified. And this is the beginning of where she for, was forcing herself. Um, you know, that sort of idea of uh, that Eleanor, you hear these Eleanor Roosevelt quotes, um, you know, uh, do the thing you think you cannot do. That's where she began to do the thing she thought she could not do and forced herself to do it. And Franklin began um, depending on her in a new way, um, first in, during the Spanish flu, um, where she was the only one in the household who was standing and she went on missions for the Navy and for Navy wives and for, uh, for to, to places where the, the pandemic, the, the Spanish flu was, was uh, rampant in Washington and the Navy uh, shipyards and the Navy uh, uh, base there were, 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 pla were places of terrible infection. Eleanor fearlessly went in with that, with the uh, baskets and food and and was a model of uh, 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 she was a, really a, a hero, uh, sort of a Florence Nightingale hero um, at, at those places. And, and at home, she was the only one who was not sick. And she took care of everyone, saw Franklin, Franklin who almost didn't survive the Spanish flu, um, saw him through the worst of that. Um, and, and on into 1919, when the women um, when women were uh, finally given the vote in the United States and suddenly politics was a new game. And when Franklin ran for uh, office in, in 1920 as vice president with, with, uh, with Cox and, and, and lost, Eleanor on the train, campaign trains with him began getting a sense of where she would fit in to his new life. And the new life was really going to be something that they didn't um, uh, expect. And, and, and it's because with Franklin's, I need to jump ahead here and then I'll come back. Um, there's Franklin um, and James Cox running uh, for president and vice president in 1920 and losing. Franklin in 1921 contracting polio, a story that you all know, so I don't need to go into that in detail, but simply to say his ideas about himself really didn't change and neither did Eleanor's in one sense. They both knew that if he was going to be, I mean, if FDR, he was something of an original in that he never changed his ideas about himself. He kept changing under circumstances, but at the heart of his life was this idea that he was going to be president and it was the only thing he was going to be good at. And it was the only thing that really was him. And, and he was not going to be a cripple because he was going to be president. He was not going to be a cripple as he called it. And as it was known at the time, because he didn't want anyone to see him that way ever. And in a way, his denial, his ability to deny and to be a deceiver now is a, became a great uh, positive in his life. He be, it, it allowed him to actually transcend a lot of what he might have gone through uh, and would have sidelined him. Eleanor also understood that in her new life, um, she was not going to be taking care of him. He, he did not want her uh, to be the person who was going to help him regain his uh, ability to walk, his ability to show people that he was unaffected by this childish, as, she, as he called it, disease. Eleanor had this choice, really, and, and, and it was at a certain point in 1921 where she was given um, in, in, it was beginning to be clear that Franklin was going to be in charge of his own recovery, and that in, in uh, everyday life, she could go to the Bryson Day Nursery, or she could go and join Narcissa uh, Cox, who here was offering her a chance to join a committee where she would follow through the con Congress and the congressional record, the proceedings and uh, of, of women's bills, bills that were going to be affecting women uh, in labor, women um, and women's uh, voting and women's um, almost every issue that was going to be under um, examination by the League of Women Voters was, that was passing through Congress was hers to report on if she decided she would do that. And she finally um, realized that she had to just put aside all of her own fears and all of her own sense of um, inadequacy, which she was helped with first by Esther Lape and Elizabeth Reed on the left. Elizabeth Reed, who was a great attorney, actually, um, and who was a Smith College a uh, professor who taught Eleanor how to think. It was another one of these uh, figures in Eleanor's life who taught her how to be a critical thinker, a pragmatic thinker. And uh, Esther Lape and, and, and Elizabeth Reed lived in Greenwich Village and would have Eleanor come down and they would all speak French. And they thought they understood Eleanor was, a, they could see that she 
liked to do things that she was a woman who could put um, herself into action. They, they, they brought that part of her out of, of encouraging her to go and do and to decide and to make up her mind and to just jump in, which is what she did. She jumped into a world through another pair of uh, women um, who were uh, involved in the world of women's democratic politics in New York State, Marion Dickerman and Nancy Cook. Um, Marion had run for office. Uh, she was the first one of the first women who run for state rep. And she and Nancy Cook were lovers and, 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 and uh, partners and political partners. And Eleanor joined in with them in the women's democratic um, uh, section of, of New York politics. But she also had a world with them that centered around the creation of Valkyll, the, the, the cottage that, that they built and that FDR was very um, uh, important to, in, in the creation of uh, by giving them his land and, and encouraging them to build this cottage um, where Eleanor kind of went through almost, it, it gave her enormous um, uh, excuse or, or, or justification to leave her mother-in-law behind and leave the Bryson Day nursery and all those sorts of women's charities behind and live this new life of politics, not just go and visit it, but to live it with Nancy and, and, uh, and Marion. But she also was in a sort of remedial relationship with them as almost as a child. I mean, this was where Eleanor as a mother, for instance, um, her children always noticed that one of her responses when she got angry was to become cold, was simply to withdraw into an icy silence. Um, there was a constant sense with Eleanor that she was hurt and that there was something wrong. And she didn't know how to express her anger. She'd never been taught. She'd been taught by her grandmother to conceal anger, to conceal her feelings, to, if she felt badly about something, simply to hide it and to go into a bathroom if she had to cry and cry into the tub. Marion and, and uh, uh, Marion Dickerman and Nancy Cook were sort of Eleanor's first set of parents who said to her, no, if you're angry about something, you tell us, you, you say, say, be responsible, but own your anger, that, all, the, all that stuff. Um, all the feelings stuff that she wasn't allowed to do and hadn't been figured out how to do with Franklin, she did with these two women or began to do. And it was a big breakthrough for her. And it's really what Val Kill in a way was all about in the first, in its first days. Um, Eleanor became an enormous figure in politics um, in New York, through New York State and through the organization of women in the state um, for Al Smith. And she took over the Democratic um, uh, wing of, of the New York state politics and became, you know, the, the, the top dog. And as she did on the Al Smith, she, she joined forces with, with other women on Al Smith's campaign. And she learned an enormous amount about how women were voting, how they were thinking, how they were organizing. She had by then committed to labor groups. She committed to women in the workplace. Um, and so that by the time Al Smith was calling Franklin Roosevelt at Warm Springs, Georgia, where he had begun uh, in 1924 and from 24 to 28, he was um, actually, sorry, began in 1922. And so for six years, he was teaching himself there how to regain the use of, of his legs, even though his legs never worked again, even though polio left him without the use of his legs, he figured out a way of walking, of appearing to walk, of convincing people that he was a mobile person. And Eleanor, as she went about her business with Al Smith and his campaigns as governor and his unsuccessful campaigns as president, was instrumental in bringing Franklin into the world of, 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 of uh, New York politics. Um, Franklin's world was the world of, uh, um, sorry, Eleanor's world was the world of women uh, in, 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 in labor, women in the workplace. And it was the first, gave her her first voice as a writer uh, and, and as a politician. She could speak directly to women and say to women, you know, the, the men have been weakened by the depression. The, the depression, when it struck in 1929, was actively dismantling the, world, the white male world uh, of power. It was uh, giving women a chance. And she was saying, it's up to us. It's up to us to figure out how to put this world back together. And when Eleanor and Franklin uh, became, joined in full partnership um, in the State House of, of New York, it, then to run for, for as Franklin ran for, for pre the presidency, they were really an unbeatable team by now in that they 
he, he represented something to the country as the depression deepened, which was hopefulness uh, and, and a kind of new way of looking at things, a pragmatism. They both, you know, they, they both had a um, strong belief in, in individual freedom um, and they were alike in that, in that commitment to the common good and to building America. Um, it was having seen Theodore Roosevelt, um, uh, Uncle Ted, you know, his robust use of government um, as the protector and guarantor of individual liberty um, that had inspired them um, when they were younger. It now forged their partnership uh, and it brought a quality um, to this partnership that became one of the great partnerships of American history um, that is sort of now today out of fashion, which is I think of it as disinterestedness or prag pragmatism, really. It's, you know, d did it work? Does, does this program, let's think of something, how, how to fix this. You know, is this, does this work? And in, if, if it doesn't work, if this policy, this program isn't helping people, isn't helping individuals, um, how can we make it? And if it's not helping um, and it's not working, let's try something else. Let's fix the underlying problem uh, and let's get to work. This is what they did when they came into the White House with one wrinkle um, that is substantial in Eleanor's story, which is that she had fallen in love. And it's one of the sweet, I found one of the sweet aspects of, of this time in her life, um, which was that she was able to find this Lorena Hickok, you see her in the upper left-hand corner, um, who was a UPI, uh, sorry, AP reporter, star reporter. She covered the Lindbergh uh, kidnapping. Uh, she kidnapping of the Lindbergh child. She covered the big stories um, of her time. She was the star and she kind of gave herself in headlong love uh, uh, of Eleanor to Eleanor and Eleanor was so impressed that Lorena Hickok was willing to give up her own life as a reporter to become a New Deal worker in a sense. Um, she went and reported on the New Deal for FDR and sent her reports back. And it was in that first uh, flush of their feelings for each other, of Eleanor's and Lorena's, they discovered a great deal, that they had a great deal in common and their letters were electric with, you know, uh, desire with eros with with all the things that you would associate with a great love story and it was all happening as they were coming into the white house um it, it when i began work on my book eleanor was sort of the i always sort of thought of her as the gay fd the gay um the gay thomas jefferson because there was a kind of sense of is you know is, is eleanor roosevelt gay is she a lesbian and 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 what do we make of this and and people um uh, you know, absolutely uh, rebelled against this idea when it was first put forth by Blanche Weiss and Cook and by um, the existence of the letters that, that went back and forth between Lorena Hickok and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, it became part of the, um, it became part of her FBI file. It became part of the, 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 the telling of the story of, of um, J. Edgar Hoover and his um, secret love affair uh, with his partner, um, it, it, it went all sorts of different places in the 90s um, and just before in the decade before I began work. What I found was that Eleanor Roosevelt was not uh, by self-definition a lesbian. I found that she was a woman who was flexibly and absolutely open to love itself, whether it was with a woman or a man. It turns out that the men of her life, Franklin, one of them, um, from her earlier life, but in her later life with a, a doctor that she fell in love with. She had feelings for men that were as, as strongly sexual and as strongly um, a part of her love system as her love for Lorena Hickok. Um, and my feeling was very strong that Eleanor was always in search of love itself, um, that her father was a guide post in her life, um, but she was also looking for a mother and she was always looking for a woman who was going to be the one in her life that who, with whom she could share things. And she rarely found what she was looking for in the end. I mean, one of the very complicated things for me about Eleanor was always that I thought I could resolve, I thought her story would resolve itself. I thought all these things that were hap going to happen to her in her life um, that we recognize and know about her life would all have resolution. They didn't really. Um, one of the great gifts that Eleanor gave me actually was the ability to tell this story um, without needing finally to resolve everything. It doesn't all come to a, um, to a, a, a perfect um, a wrap up um, and conclusion 
But there is a moment, and, and I'm gonna jump ahead to it. Um, I mean, when Eleanor first, as first lady, she connected in ways that no first lady had before. Um, she became something uh, 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 in American civil rights. Um, she became something in American politics. She became something in the American Second World War and the war effort that no first lady and no woman had had ever done before. Uh, and that was to connect in a way where she was not an auxiliary president, but she was in a power to the side of the presidency. She always respected and, and did exactly what was needed, in, including, in fact, um, with this horrible, um, uh, the internment of the, of the Japanese Americans in the, during the beginning of the war, one of FDR's worst mistakes as president, Eleanor had to publicly support it while privately pressing him to find alternatives and ways to help uh, Japanese Americans um, as he in, in incarcerated them um, in, in, um, in concentration camps across the American West. When FDR died, Eleanor's, um, and, and Eleanor first returned um, to private life after his death, she was less a president's widow than she was an autonomous uh, presence for whom there was no pre precedent. And, you know, people expected her to fade quietly, um, but, you know, she didn't that she didn't just go into mourning, but sourced into new lines of energy and, and, and outreach to become Truman's post-war, Harry Truman's post-war champion of international human rights, um, an enemy of the FBI and of the KKK and, uh, you know, the most serious day to day opposition uh, voice uh, uh, in the D Democratic Party was extraordinary. And she became her own institution. Um, and not a derivative um, institution of the presidency and not just simply a widow. Um, and it was really in those final years that she served, um, began to serve universal ideals and appealing by appealing non-politically um, to fundamental needs of human beings. And this is what really made Eleanor great. It wasn't, she, she brought her own understanding of her own suffering, of her own needs, of her own humanness into this world uh, of post-war, um, uh, the post-war uh, 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 global rights as a global rights champion. Uh, it was the, the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which was intended, of course, to prevent uh, recurrence of the horrors of World War II, um, where she found her greatness. Um, I'm skipping over these pictures, some of them, but that's David Gurevich, the doctor she fell in love with and lived with to the end of her life. Um, and who was younger than she was and with whom she had a very, very intense and close relationship, unrequited, but, but still very close. As the, as the, um, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as I mentioned, was intended to uh, uh, prevent a recurrence of, of World War II atrocities. Eleanor in 1946 went um, when she was in England as a representative of uh, the United States at the first, uh, second meeting of the, U of the UN, she went and saw the suffering of displaced persons. When she came back and debated the issue of um, all of these refugees in camps in Germany, for example, with uh, her Russian counterpart, Vyshinsky, he his point, the Soviet point, was that these people were traitors, that they they should never be returned to their countries. Uh, they were traitors and, and should be executed or treated as such, or, or simply uh, whatever country they'd come from should decide what, what should become of them. Eleanor forcefully objected to this, um, you know, said that repatriation of any human being was completely against uh, uh, what, what uh, US democracy and, and, and US interests. And she brought all of this kind of very forceful, very direct understanding of what we were going to do about our post-war issues to the creation of the declaration. And, and right away, she created a kind of a, 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 an atmosphere of dignity uh, to discuss the basic with, with 52 nations and the representatives of, of all those countries. She began discussing what constituted basic human rights and what was fundamental to human dignity and well-being. Was it housing? You know, was it was it access to education? Was it un, was it employment? Was it was it food? You know, was it physical safety? What 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 was what were the needs of human beings, and how are we going to decide uh, what they were and ensure that 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 we that we were going to have them? People were going to have them, and she created a culture of human dignity for this to be uh, discussed and for it to be agreed upon. 
her colleagues um, were admiring of the way she was able to moderate between all these intractable points of view from all these different cultures, uh, different religions, different ideas about how different political systems. Um, the, the 30 rights and freedoms that are listed in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, including the right to free speech, of course, the right to asylum, the right to freedom uh, from torture, the right to be a citizen and the right to be considered innocent until proven. All of these things were, had never been adopted by members of United Nations. Um, and in December 10th, 1948, uh, it was, they, 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 it, the, the, the declaration was passed. She, for the first time, received a standing ovation for the first time ever. And I think um, for years afterwards in UN history, first time where someone, where a, a single person received an ovation. Um, she wanted always to expand democracy to include more people. Um, we did not have, and it's kind of odd to think of her life from her 78 years of life, 19, 1884, 1962, she, we did not have an inclusive multiracial democracy. Um, and when she was 36 years old, um, you know, the women, women finally got the right to vote. She did not live to see the Voting Rights Act um, where African-Americans um, were guaranteed the right to vote. Um, uh, in her lifetime. She did not live to see the United States outlaw mob violence and lynching. Um, Eleanor was always looking for a way to create a better world for you and me, uh, for us to remember that our government and our constitution was there for us if we were willing to support it and to actively defend it. Her own death which uh, is a complicated story. Um, she saw her life ending and knew that she wanted to die. She was very, she had a great struggle medically with her doctor uh, over this. Um, she, he did not, he wanted to save her, of course. And, and of course he would, um, but the struggle was, was caused her greater suffering than, than, than she wanted and that, that should have happened. But it, in the end, her life, which was her, 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 her funeral, which was attended by four presidents and her life, which ended at 78, an incredibly young age today, um, just gives us a feeling um, when you stand there at, the, at her um, grave in Hyde Park, in her mother's, her mother-in-law's rose garden, um, you sense her greatness, um, you sense their greatness, but you sense with, I always felt with Eleanor that it's a, what her life is about is facing, as she always did, um, her own self for real, for who she really was, and uh, being uh, kind to herself, but always having the courage to look at herself, painful as things were, uh, and to let herself be who she was and to grow through that. And to, that growth, that transformation is what became her constant and would is what makes her story worth reading. It's also a time, I think now, where we're understanding that everything she has to teach us, we've learned, we have to learn all over again. And it's really, as we fight again over our right to vote, over gender equity, over America's place in a global um, international world, Eleanor still stands, and probably more so than ever for fearlessness for compassion, for service, for dedication, um, for hard work, the hard work of expanding um, this democracy that, that is now hanging in the balance. Uh, one of my favorite things about Eleanor was that she was a giver. Um, she began giving, uh, what you're looking at is Christmas at Valkyll, and I just include this slide just to end and round off, just simply to say, um, she would begin shopping on January 1st for the next year. And these piles, which look as if about 40 people are coming over, each, there's, those piles are for, this is for about six people <laughs> or maybe 10 um, and maybe, maybe fewer even. Um, but Eleanor couldn't stop giving. And it was the thing that is overwhelmingly tender and loving and lovely about her. It's also kind of a burden, by the way, um, both for her and those she gave to. But that's another story. And that's in the book. But I love that she never stopped giving and would wrap every single one of these, by the way. And 
um, that she had spent all year long buying each of these different things for the people she loved. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt is endlessly fascinating and I'm gonna miss her a lot. And thank you for listening and um, I take any questions that anybody has and keep chatting. You'd if like you to. have a question, that was an amazing, and I could understand why the two historians said it was the perfect biography for our time. It Thank certainly what it certainly is. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat function, and I will read them. Uh, and of course, we're getting wonderful thank yous. I don't know if you can see them. Can you see them? Thank um, you. Somebody asked, she, what did she, she die di from? She died from tuberculosis, um, which was a reactivation of um, a infection that she had gotten probably in 1919 when she went to the front with her husband, with Franklin Roosevelt, uh, went to see the trenches after the war. And then in London, um, where she had something, she was diagnosed with pleurisy, but it's probably TB. And she recovered from that illness. And it w when she got this infection, a drug resistant infection in her later life in 1962, when she was 70, or six, sorry, 1960, um, when she was 75, uh, it, it was a drug resistant strain, but she was given a certain drug that activated, triggered the older infection and some combination of the two, the drug resistant strain of TB and the older infection um, made her very, very sick. And they could never, she never really she never recovered from, from that. And she went through agony um, in, in, in her, her great love, uh, David Gurbich's heroic efforts, understandably heroic efforts to try to save her. Somebody asked if you would speak more about her living with the doctor and his wife under one roof. Yeah, they lived, um, well, Eleanor met David Gurbich after the war when she actually simply was moving back to New York City and needed a new doctor. And she met this wonderful emigre from, um, from Russia and from, from uh, uh, war-torn Europe. And he, he had come to America and he was, he was actually a polio. He specialized in, in polio treatments. And um, they simply met and then they re-met and he needed her to help him get to a sanatorium. He had tuberculosis. He needed to get to a sanatorium in 1947. She was going to Geneva and she helped him get to, to the sanatorium and they fell in love on this plane ride over to, she was going on her way to Geneva for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Committee meetings and they fell in love. And to make a long story short, she just adored him. I mean, she just gave herself to him in ways that she, I don't think she maybe ever gave herself to any other person. He was divorcing at the time um, and he had a young daughter. Um, he was, um, he was a, a man who, um, well, he, he, during that period, it was clear they weren't going to have a reciprocal um, love relationship, but they became nonetheless extremely emotionally important to each other. Um, he went through a series of affairs and so forth, resolving in this marriage, um, in a second marriage, uh, with a, a young woman, Edna Perkel, who was a gal ran, ran, uh, was an art specialist and ran a gallery. And, and they lived in the city. And uh, David Gervich married her. And they moved in together with Eleanor to a building that Eleanor and they bought together on East 74th Street. And it gave her a kind of a grounding in her later life that she very much needed and wanted. But again, she was there. She was in a sort of triangle with a, with a sort of pair of, not parents in this case. She was very much the senior uh, of the of the triangle of the group, but she very much depended on them, and they were um, they were you know they were part of they were an integral part of her life, and then became the medical drama and all of the attendant of the drama of the last part of her life made it in an even more complicated relationship. Mm -hmm. It's worth reading on that if you're interested in it in in Eleanor because most of the earlier versions of this, uh, Mrs. Gerbich wrote a very good memoir. Uh, I strongly recommend you reading that if you're interested. But but I tried to synthesize some of the some of the different parts that had not been put on to the record. Well, we have many many compliments and people saying how they're going to go and read your book. But I think we'll just end with this because it's time. Um, and this is a one question Joyce asked: How do you suggest to motivate women to follow in her footsteps now? Uh, 
vote. I mean, I think be a be a great uh, advocate and 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 champion of voting and of uh, making sure that everybody votes. I think it's one of the great Eleanor uh, messages that we can't uh, ever hear enough of, and um, I think it's um, I think it's the, the one. It's the way we need we need to make sure that voting rights become the dominant become our dominant effort. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, extraordinary. Um discussion on, on Eleanor. I see you've delved into her life quite a bit. And this is a one volume, uh, the first volume in six years on Eleanor's life. I thank David and I thank you all for coming. And um, uh, please get the book. It's available at our local book, the Chappaqua Local Bookstore, which is Scattered Books. And I hope you will use them to purchase your book. Thank you, David, again. And thank Thanks you so all much. for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Jen. Bye-bye now.